Hello. How are you guys getting on? Oh. Hey, there you go. Love it when it actually all starts firing up and it starts looking like it's actually working. Yeah, how are you guys getting on? You guys must all be self-isolating, which must be exceedingly fun. Hmm. An error occurred. Interesting. Can you guys see me? Sorry, concerned that you can't. Hang on. If you could say hi or something, that'd be fantastic. Yes, okay, it looks good. We're looking promising. Bam. Awesome, yeah, how are you? How are you guys getting on? How have you found the last like three days? It must be a weird one. Hello, hey Sada, hey Ali, hey Alicia. <laughs> Can you get your money back from Crash Course if you're in year 13? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Hi, um, is this thing going to be daily? Good question, yes. Um, I should probably answer some questions, shouldn't I? So yesterday, I don't know if any of you guys were watching the chemistry session that we did, but I got very briefly taken like off of YouTube for a bit because I don't think YouTube are liking anyone using the C-bomb, and I don't mean the actual C-bomb. I mean the you-know-what, which is why we're all here. Um, and apparently any kind of misinformation or any potential misinformation, they're just taking things down. So throughout this, which is going to be weird, I'm not going to use that term. You know what I mean? Um, so if I ever say something about like self-isolation or something like quarantine, that's fine, I think. But I just can't say the you-know-what, right? Which is very, very bizarre. But um, yeah, so these sessions then, this home study club, essentially the idea is that every day... Um, we're going to be doing something, SnapRevise is going to be doing something just to sort of tell you a little bit about us, just to hopefully tie you lot over. So every day, um, it's either going to be chemistry or biology. I'm not too sure with physics and chemistry, uh, sorry, physics and maths just yet. I'm sure we're going to do something with them at some point. But I'm basically going to start at the start of year 12 and just make my way through uh, some exam questions on pretty much every topic. So hopefully by the time that everyone's back in school again, um, we're going to be in a situation where everyone knows everything that they need to know, or at least we haven't done nothing over the course of the time we feel like we can actually get something done. Um, so these are going to be at three o'clock every day, um, I believe. So from what I've been told, it's going to be three o'clock till roughly four o'clock. They might not all be an hour, they might be like 45 minutes, but I'm pretty sure most will be about an hour. Um, oh, Jackie, that's very sweet of you. Um, what else can I say? Oh, I saw some of you were doing, um, you were asking questions about what's going on regarding schools and exams and stuff. Uh, the government released a really, really good document the other day um, about exams. So if you are in year 13 and you're worried about what's going on, uh, have a look at the government website and basically Google government and um, A-level exams. And basically everything will come up and it will tell you everything that you need to sort of be aware of. So I read it yesterday and it seems fairly, fairly clear what's going down. I don't know if I should talk about it too much just in case, I don't know. I probably won't say it and I'll end up paraphrasing it and getting something wrong. So have a look at the government website and have a look at the advice about exams and that should help. Year 12s will just end up going back to school next year. So next year, year 12s will go back and I'm assuming it will all be pretty much exactly the same. <clears throat> right. <laughs> Had you on because you are a rock star. That is exactly why. Nice. Yeah, I imagine some of you guys in year eleven could do this just as a nice way to start sort of thinking. Um, but yeah, let's let's have a go then. Let's get started. So we're going to look at carbohydrates, and we're essentially just going to go through a few questions, see what you guys know, and go from there. Rosie, I don't know about that, but thank you. Um, oh. One thing which I forgot to mention as well, um, at the end of this session, um, I've got a coupon code. So for those of you that enjoy what you're seeing, um, Snap provides do, or we're gonna be doing these sessions on YouTube, but I'm also doing two other lessons every day um, on our website, which you have to obviously pay for. But we've got a coupon code for, for those of you that are interested, have a look at that. But obviously have a look at, have watch this video first, yeah? See what you think, see what you think of what we're doing. And then if you're really into it, then why not? And if you're not, then don't worry. Uh, the code will be at the end. Ha, 
as if I just put it at the very start, as if as if I would make you sit through everything first. Although you could just not watch her and come back in an hour, but shh. Right, anyway. First question then. First nice straightforward question to have a look at. So which bonds are held together, uh, sorry, which bonds hold together the structure of cellulose? Oh, and for those of you that asked earlier about what spec, um, this is gonna be all of the specs. So I basically have loads of resources and I just pick and choose random questions. So uh, A is glycosidic, hydrogen, and ionic. Um, B is uh, glycosidic and hydrogen only. C is glycosidic and ionic only. And D is uh, hydrogen and ionic only. Geez, these are some very varied answers. <laughs> right, okay, out of interest then. Out of interest, which one is definitely involved in cellulose? So which one is the one which you don't even need to think about? It's just this one is certainly in cellulose. Like what out of these three? Blue neck, guys. <laughs> right, cool. I've seen enough people say it, right? So for sure, like it has to be the case that glycosidic are in cellulose, right? So every one of you, if you do A-level biology, you should know that glycosidic bonds are the ones that form between um, two sugars, right? And they have like a COC or a cock or something like that. Some way to remember, I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a second, right? So glycosidic bonds definitely. Are hydrogen bonds in cellulose? I did say COC, I did, I did, I did. Can hold me accountable. Yeah, hydrogen bonds are there too, right? So with hydrogen bonds, um, you guys should know that cellulose is made up of very, very long um, chains and these sort of microfibrils, they get hydrogen bonded together, meaning that you end up with this very, very uh, strong, like it's a really high tensile strength molecule, which can be involved in cell walls. Um, what about ionic bonds? Yeah, most of you are saying no, yeah. Um, so ionic bonds are the ones, oh, you probably remember from chemistry from last year, they're the ones where there is a difference in charge um, and there's therefore an electrostatic attraction between those two molecules. So if there is a positive and a negative charge, those two things try to come together essentially they attract. So it's glycosidic and hydrogen, meaning that the answer has to be B. How many of you said just B at the start? Chemistry check. Yeah, that's a good show. I need a little section name, chemistry check. Yeah, just the boy. And then add lad. Good. Good. Oh, I'm pleased. Look at that. <laughs> I know everyone. Well, I know not everyone. I know lots of you are liars as well. This is nice to know. Um, but yes, well done, guys. Cool. Next question. Oh, I think I chose some quite hard ones. First, actually. So which adaptation, oh, they're not all going to be multiple choice either. Uh, which adaptation would increase the active transport of carbohydrates from a plant? So uh, having areas where there is a thin wall, an increased permeability of the cell wall, a large surface area of the cell surface membrane, or a selective permeability of the vacuole membrane. So which one of these is going to help with active transport? C's and A's, it looks like at the moment. Most C's, though. And one B. <laughs> okay, so um, areas where the cell wall is thin, that's not really going to have much of an effect on active transport because active transport has to use some um, membrane um, carrier, doesn't it? So it can't be that one. It's not that one. Agreed. Um, increased permeability of a cell wall. Again, cell wall not really so much to do with active transport, not that one. Uh, left with two then. So selective permeability of a vacuum membrane or a large surface area. Um, most of you are actually correct. So the answer is actually C, a large surface area, because if your membrane has, I don't know, some folds like villi or microvilli, um, as opposed to having just a few active transport um, carriers, right? So if they have to be that distance apart, if I had that the same, well, roughly the same distance apart on a membrane which has a, mu has a much larger um, surface area to volume ratio, then I can just fit like far more of them, right? So having a large surface area 
is always going to improve active transport because it means you can basically have more carriers which are there or more pumps which are there and that's always going to be a helpful option. Awesome. Right. This is one which I think this is all AS. So all of this stuff is year 12 stuff. Uh, I will get to year 13 stuff, but I'm going to go through year 12 first because I assume most year 13s probably are chilling and I assume lots of year 12s are probably panicking. Um, I'm intrigued how many of you know what alpha glucose looks like. This is literally the first lesson in biology, right? What does alpha glucose look like? What are we saying? <laughs> if you're in year 13, not all of year 13 are chilling. I do understand that lots of you are probably still revising really, really hard to make sure that you are um, in the best place in case you get uh, asked or in case you choose to do an exam, I guess. They all look the same. They definitely don't all look the same. That one definitely doesn't look the same. It's got a massive oxygen at the top. Right, Bs, Ds, does AQA need to know this? Yes. Explosive gems, I apologize that you're stressed. <laughs> okay, alpha glucose, where do the hydroxyl groups, in fact, let's, let's slow down a bit, right. This thing over here is called a hydroxyl group. If you've got an OH, that's called a hydroxyl group. Where do the hydroxyl groups have to be for something to be alpha glucose. So in alpha glucose, where do the hydroxyl groups um, orientate themselves? Or how, what do they look like? <laughs> so they attach to carbon one and four, yeah. So carbon one is that one, two, three, four, five, and six. But that doesn't tell us what direction they are. So <laughs> with alpha glucose, with alpha glucose, both hydroxyl groups are on the bottom. Okay, and the only one where they're both on the bottom is D. So it's got to be D, right? So alpha glucose, both of the hydroxyl groups are on the bottom. Beta glucose, they are inverted. So one of them, I like that, alpha ankles. Uh, one of them has uh, it's sort of like that, I guess. Or one of them looks like that. So that's beta glucose. And this one is alpha. Okay, so if you want a way to remember this, one of the many ways that teachers seem to have of just remembering things. So alpha glucose, remember that they are both uh, in the same position. And also remember that they are the ones that make up starch. Right, and then beta is just the other one. Ants on the ground, bees in the air. B3 equals opposite. Lovely. Yeah, that's essentially it. Um, when we were talking about glycosidic bonds earlier, I said there's like a COC thing to look out for, right? Um, I don't know if my face is getting in your way, but my face is getting in my way when I'm trying to draw stuff. So I would expect every single person who does A-level biology, especially in a position where you guys, I guess, have got through most of the year, I'd expect every single person, <laughs> it's ironic if I've just done it wrong, I'd expect every single person to be able to draw um, glucose properly, right? And in terms of being able to draw um, a disaccharide, I'd also expect all of my students to be able to do that too. So if I had something like starch, or I guess before I get to starch, it would be maltose. Um, just so I can show you what it looks like to show you this COC bond. And I know lots of you are probably thinking that this is really easy. And I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure there's probably an even mix of people who are like, this is ridiculous. And people who are like, oh my God, how do you remember that? Um, but this is definitely something that I'd advise every single person to know off by heart and draw it out until you can. Um, in terms of this glycosidic bond, you literally take water out because it's a condensation reaction. So H2O, part of matters like an A, but it is an H. If you take those out and remove it, then you're left with C, O, and then that will bind to this C. So if I just put it in the middle, you end up with this sort of pattern. So this is why I called it a cock bond, because you literally have C, O, C in your glycosidic bond. Okay, um, am I a teacher? I used to be a teacher. So last year I taught in a secondary school, and then I decided that that was too hard. So I chose to work for Snap Revise. <laughs> that is a side joke, but genuinely teaching is normally quite hard. Um, Apart from if what's gone down at the moment has gone down and you're just chilling out. So anyway, um, this is a fairly standard exam question, which lots of people struggle with. So what do I mean by a monomer? So if you were asked to describe a monomer, what would you say? I'm glad you're enjoying Cockbond. 
small repeating unit, single repeating unit, single unit. Is it a protein? No. Small unit, which a larger one's made. Good. Yeah. So I think the best way of sort of defining it is you want to think of it as something which is small because it's something that ultimately makes up something which is large and it repeats. So in um, starch, which is a polymer, it's just got this molecule again and again and again and again. So small molecule, which repeats. I'm happy with that for one mark. Lovely. Nice. I think that'll, that'll do. Can anyone think of anything more that you could possibly say? Uh, yeah, you could say a subunit. If you don't want to say, if you don't want to say molecule, um, subunit is fine. Anything else? Monosaccharide polymer is made from them. I'm gonna. I think with biology, I think I'm gonna be doing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So every other day, I'm pretty sure. Um, chemistry is Tuesday and Thursday. If that makes sense. Cool. <laughs> right, let's have a look at this next one. So uh, as most of you guys will be aware, you essentially get to a stage in biology, don't you? Where you learn everything and you go through the textbook and you're like, oh yeah, this is easy. This is so straightforward, ha, huh? laughing. And then you see something like this and say, like, oh, well, apparently now my life is a pain again and they're actually applying it. So this is a fairly good example of a normal A-level question, um, just where they expect the knowledge and they then expect you to uh, apply it. So there is a good chance of this is an AQA question. Yes, I do still on. I have a whole resource pile of like OCR questions, LXL questions, international LXL questions, CIE questions, AQA questions. This is just one of the AQA ones. Yeah. Uh, right. Anyway, so lactulose is a disaccharide. So let's we know should know what that means anyway. Um, formed from one molecule of galactose and one molecule of fructose. Other than being um, disaccharides, give one similarity and one difference between the structures of lactulose and lactose. So this expects you to know what lactose is made up of. Okay, can they tell you what lac uh, lactulose is? But they expect lactose too. So what can we say? Uh, no, this is no one needs to know what this molecule is because they tell you, right? They've told you what it is, so you don't need to know anything. Okay, so lots of you are saying the right thing. So good. Um, clearly, you guys know that lactose is made of glucose plus galactose. And you have seen that lactulose is made up of galactose and fructose. So one similarity, which is the only real similarity apart from uh, the assumption that they're all made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, is that both are made of galactose. Whoops, cancel. Okay. Um, what else could you have said? Yeah, you could have actually got a mark if you'd said that both have glycosidic bonds. I'd give that to you. So those of you who've said that, I'm happy with that. Um, and then that's about it, actually. So, yeah, they don't allow you to have CHNO, which seems a bit weird, actually, because this one's clearly made of CHNO as well. But I don't know. These are easier differences anyway. So what is the difference then? So, Natasha, whilst you are right in what you're saying, that's not a structural thing. It's asking you about the structure. Can you say they both have glucose? No, you can't say they both have glucose because this one's got fructose and galactose and the other one doesn't. Good. Good, 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 good. Lovely. So be really careful with how you answer this. So you need to say something along the lines of um, lactulose has this, whereas lactose has this. Uh, so if you sort of don't do that, if you just say, um, I'll do the standard student thing where someone would say something like lactulose... Uh, has fructose and then they move on to the next question and they wouldn't get that second mark right so in a level biology it's fundamentally important that you say that one thing has this whereas the other one has this or the other one doesn't have this or something like this uh, otherwise you won't get the marks so lactulose has fructose 
whereas lactase, in fact, I don't even like the word has, um, let's say is made of um, glucose or something like that. Okay, something like that would be good. Um, if you don't do that, you will lose lots of marks. So be careful. Okay, um, just joined. Are you going to be doing questions or content or both? I'm just going through exam questions. So the plan is that I've got enough um, questions for each little topic. So if I start with carbohydrates and then logically go on to like lipids, proteins, enzymes, I don't know what else follows. But if I sort of go through it, have the books roughly go through it, then hopefully by about, I don't know, in a month's time, we will have got through half of the year 12 course and you'll have exam questions on it and you just keep your brain active. There you go. Um, anyway, right, next question. So looking at some polymers then, <laughs> looking at some polymers, uh, glycogen and cellulose are both carbohydrates. Um, describe two differences between the structure of cellulose and uh, glycogen. So how are glycogen and cellulose different. I'm not, I don't, I, I think Snap Provider on TikTok. I personally am not. Um, do, 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 beta glucose versus alpha glucose. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Uh, actually, no, yeah, unfortunately, yes, I'm talking absolute nonsense. Um, yeah, cellulose um, and uh, glycogen do have different glucose molecules, but it would definitely be correct. What else? Cellulose is linear. Glycogen is branched. Good. Yeah, that's really good. Cellulose straight chains. Uh, yep. Yeah. Glycogen is branched. Hydroxyl group and hydrogen inverted. Yes, so alpha and beta glucose. Um, <laughs> Stan Crane, well done for working that out. Cool. Yeah, I think you guys have said enough. So in terms of glycogen and cellulose, then, describe two differences. Again, you need to make sure that you're um, writing this in sort of full sentences. So the first difference that lots of you have said um, is the presence of alpha glucose and beta glucose. So we need to say that glycogen is made up of alpha glucose because it's very similar to starch, um, but it's made up of alpha glucose, whereas cellulose is made up of beta Apologize for my handwriting before. For those of you who aren't used to my handwriting, I can only apologize. Um, the other thing most you said um, was glycogen is highly branched. Um, whereas cellulose has long straight fibers. Do you guys know if glycogen is um, more branched than starch? Does anyone know that? Is cellulose polar? No. How long is this live? An hour-ish? Maybe 45 minutes-ish? Amylopectin and glycogen. Um, so amylopectin and glycogen are actually very, very similar. So uh, yeah, glycogen is more branched than starches. So glycogen is like the most branched carbohydrate um, that you'll ever come across in A-level biology. Um, but yeah, it's very, very similar to amylopectin. Um, just so you know as well, you could have got some other marks here for saying that glycogen has one, four and one, six glycosidic bonds. For those of you that know what I mean when I say that, whereas uh, cellulose only has one, four. That's weird. So what is amylopectin? Um, essentially what it is, right, is we need a way to store sugar um, in our bodies because otherwise it would just stay in your bloodstream and that's really really bad it really affects water potential of things it can cause dehydration if you have too much glucose in your blood so glucose gets stuck together um, as this molecule this really long polymer kind of like this um, and in animals the one that we have is called glycogen so it has this really long sort of branching structure which sort of goes a bit crazy um, and the point of that 
is it's got a really big surface area. So the enzymes that you have, they have to act at the end of um, the chain. So if you have more ends of your chain because it's branched, then you have more positions for your amylase to actually act on to undergo uh, hydrolysis reactions. So glycogen is very, very branched to increase its surface area. Okay, cool. So starch is a carbohydrate often stored in plant cells. Describe and explain. So make sure that with explain, you're saying why. Two features of starch that make it a good storage molecule. Amylopectin is only in plants, yes. Yes, you need to know about amylopectin. <laughs> so uh, describe two features that make it a good storage molecule. Why does insoluble make it a good storage molecule? Why does being highly branched make it a good storage molecule? Why is being compact making it a good storage molecule? Insoluble, so it doesn't affect water central. Yes, good. Good, so it's not, it's polar, it's not polar, so it doesn't affect water central. Yes. Um, doesn't go across cell membranes because it's um, too big. Good. Compact, so more storage. Yeah, good. Yeah, enough of you are saying the right things here. Um, so, you want to say something like that. I think the most important thing is it's insoluble. Okay, if it's insoluble, it means it has absolutely no effect on the water potential. So imagine that you were a plant cell and you uh, had all this sugary stuff stored in your vacuole. Um, if it was soluble, then loads of water would start to move into your vacuole and it would just cause things to happen that you don't necessarily want. Um, so insoluble, uh, and then we could say there is no effect on water potential no chance of osmotic lysis or something you probably well you definitely don't need that last sentence but in case you want to why not and then the other thing which lots of you said um or well, there were a few options that quite a lot of you said something along the lines of it's got um, a large or it's branched so it's got a large surface area I think it would be worth saying for enzymes. And I think it's also worth saying large surface area to volume ratio. Um, for enzymes, or you could say it's um, not small. You could say it's large, so it can't diffuse out of cells. That'd be really bad. Um, or you could say it's compact, so you can fit a lot of it into a small space. Any of those things, absolutely fine. Nice. What's water potential? Um, water potential is kind of like concentration of water, if that makes sense. So for, I don't really know why we don't talk about it as a concentration gradient, it seems a bit weird, but basically the higher the water potential, the more water there is, is a really simple way of knowing it. Um, why, when, ooh, when would you use surface area to volume ratio or mention surface area in a question? There? <laughs> like, whenever it's important that the surface area is large? Keep it there for a minute. You guys can have these slides, by the way. You don't need to, um, like, write it all down or screenshot it. Just watch this video back again and then screenshot it every three seconds. Yeah, pure water is zero, exactly. Zero has the highest water potential of zero. Anything um, that isn't water, which has something dissolved in it, will be a minus number. So most of them are minus. Can you say large surface area for absorption? Yes, you certainly can. What's amylopectin? Um, it's a storage molecule. Uh, it's part, basically starch comes in two flavors, right? Uh, there's amylose, which isn't really very branched. And there's amylopectin, which is uh, very, very branched. That's basically it. Is this the end? No. Aisha, is this the end? Is that like a metaphysical question? Like, are you asking, is this the end of the world? Or are you asking, is this the end of my session? Because both of them know. Yeah, this is the first biology stream. Do we do exam question packs? We actually do do some, but I think you have to be, I think you have to be a paid member to get them, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, so uh, in mammals, in the early stages of pregnancy, a developing embryo exchanges a substance with its mother uh, via cells in the lining of the uterus. 
At this stage, there is a high concentration of glycogen in the cell lining of the uterus. Describe the structure of glycogen. Easy. <laughs> Don't worry about the question mark. This is your worst topic. Oh, that's all right. So you're mostly saying the right things here. So uh, tell me the type of glucose it's made from and then tell me the structure, essentially. And that's it. So glycogen, alpha glucose, one mark. Uh, you could say glycosidic bonds. If it's glycogen, you're going to have one four and you're going to have one six um, glycosidic bonds. And then you could say that it's highly branched, right? You only need two of them. And it's really odd that some specifications talk about one four glycosidic bonds and one six glycosidic bonds, but some don't. So if you've never heard of this before, just totally ignore it, right? But essentially, one four leads to a straight chain because you've got, hang on, if I quickly draw it for you, again, just make sure you're in the habit of being able to draw glucose really quickly. Whoops. Right, so essentially, that's carbon one, that's carbon four. Right? And this one's carbon six. If you have carbon one joined to the next carbon four, you're going to get a really long straight chain. If you have carbon uh, one joined to carbon six, you get all these weird little kind of branching structures that form. So that's the difference, for those of you who don't know this. Um, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, cool. I think everyone's happy. Um, those of you wanting to sign up for things, I'm pretty sure that my man behind the laptop, behind the computer, um, will be able to tell you what you need for those of you who need any specific questions. Um, right. Suggest and explain two ways that the cell surface membranes of signs of signs of cells lying in the uterus may be adapted to allow rapid transport of nutrients. So if you are a cell of the uterus, how is it going to be adapted for rapid transport of nutrients, specifically something like glucose? Suggest and explain. Be careful, right? If you're asked to explain, you can't just say large surface area. You need to tell me why that is good. Or you need to tell me how it has a large surface area. So what's going to cause it to have a large surface area, I guess, is the, is the question. Thin surface membrane. Mina, be careful with that. No membranes are thinner than others, really. But they're mostly all the same. Uh, thin walls. We don't really have cell walls, so I'm not going to really accept that. Good. The doherty, the dockery, the dorery, whatever your name is. You have been the first person I've seen say the thing that I wanted you to say. Lots of other people have said another thing that you can also get marks for as well. One cell thick. Uh, I, do you know for a fact that the cells lying in the uterus are one cell thick? Because I don't. I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, so explain one way that's going to allow rapid transport of nutrients. So large surface area. Large surface area, and we want to say that the reason that it's large is because it's really highly folded, right? So the easiest way to increase your surface area if you are a cell is to just have loads of folds like this. Right? It means there's much more surface for things to happen, right? So that's one way. Exactly, make sure you explain it. Um, second thing then, suggest and explain two ways the cell surface membranes are adapted. You couldn't really talk about surface area to volume ratio because we're specifically talking about the membranes. So I'm talking about this membrane, right? So what else do membranes have on them? Think about the word that we use to describe membranes. What do they have in them? Would referencing villi be wrong? Probably not, but I would say it's highly folded. You could say um, by having villi. Network of blood vessels. Yeah, I could see why you would say a, a network of blood vessels, um, because you're assuming, therefore, there's a medium which is moving. Um, we don't know that it's going into the bloodstream, though. It feasibly isn't. It could be just going into um, uterus cells and then into another cell. I don't know. So we don't necessarily know that there's going to be a bloodstream nearby. Good. Zara Hussein, you have said it. I think someone else has said it, too. Also, Allah, you have said it too, but you need another few sentences. So uh, another way that they are adapted is they will have, um, they'll be embedded with thousands of transport proteins.
I don't want to say thousands. Uh, presence of, um, I don't know, loads, lots, numerous, high concentration, I don't know. Presence of loads of transport proteins. Right, that's how you end up helping um, diffusion to happen. You just have transport proteins all over the place, which are going to allow as many things to move as possible. Right, if we're using that to transport feasibly, you could have more mitochondria too. Uh, this is AS level. This is A. Not many people call it AS level anymore. This is like the year 12 stuff. Why does folding give a high surface area? Because there's literally more surface. Look, if, if it was a straight line, this line here, if I measured it in centimeters, it would be much shorter than that line there, wouldn't it? That line, which goes like all wavy, is going to have much more surface. Where are transport proteins? They will just be covering the entire membrane. So all membranes are going to have a load of proteins stuck in them. Yeah, literally first topic ever. Cool. Who's lost motivation? None of you have lost motivation. You're all really motivated individuals because A-level biology is the most fun thing in the world. Um, right, this is a bit sort of left field, this question. This is something which is slightly different. It's a slightly different part of the specification. Um, but cells lying in the ileum of mammals absorb the monosaccharide glucose by co-transport with sodium ions. Explain how co-transport happens. So this is mostly an AQA thing, this one, actually. OK, so there is a sodium potassium pump. What does a sodium potassium pump do? And also be careful, make sure you draw the little pluses when you talk about the sodium potassium pump, because it tells you they're ions. What does this thing do? Actively out of the ileum into the cell. No, not out of the ileum. Close. It pumps sodium. Where does it move sodium to? I don't think I've seen anyone say the right answer yet. Oh, out of epithelial cells into where, Mariam? You are right. You are closest, I believe. Not into the cell. From ileum to the blood. Hannah, you are spot on. So essentially what happens, right? is I've got my villi up here. I have um, some epithelial cells. So I guess here are some cells here. Fair no, let's, let's leave it like that actually. So my villi are gonna be my epithelial cells. Um, I've got a bloodstream coming along here. That kind of looks 3D. And this is the lumen of my ileum. So this is the lumen where all your food is. So imagine this is like, if that's the lumen, so the hole that your food will go through, then this thing here is just the wall. So this wall is kind of looking like that, if that makes sense. Right. So essentially, sodium is pumped from um, the epithelial cells into the bloodstream. So sodium ions are pumped into the bloodstream. So sodium, uh, let's say that we've got a capillary or something around the outside. The first step is sodium is being pumped that way. What does that do? So sodium can diffuse down its concentration gradient into the ileum, not into the ileum because it's already in the ileum. Sodium must go into the ileum if it is to be co-transported. Sodium is already in the ileum. Creates concentration gradient, excellent, I'll give that. So by pumping sodium ions, out of my epithelial cells and into my capillary, I now have a greater concentration of sodium in my uh, ileum than I do in my epithelial cell. So sodium, potassium pumps, um, they move Na or they actively transport sodium um, into the capillary. This establishes, I'm being lazy here, Conk grad um, for sodium ions. So there is a higher concentration of sodium in the lumen. So there's a really high concentration of sodium in the middle now. So sodium, I said that weirdly. So sodium is going to move through something called a co transport protein in the membrane. And it just so happens to take glucose along for the ride too. So glucose comes with it, right? So a concentration gradient for sodium. Um, Sodium ions move through 
co-transport proteins. Taking glucose with them. And then finally, glucose will just build up its concentration uh, in here and it'll get to the point where it gets so high that it just diffuses through. It'll need a special uh, facilitated diffusion carrier to do that, um, which I think is called GLUT2 or GLUT4. But that's what it'll do. Glucose builds up. Cool. This is AQA, this bit. So most people don't really cover this, um, apart from you kind of do in, I think OCR mentions this in the section about the kidneys, because you have this happening in the proximal convoluted tubule as well. So uh, this co-transport thing, which I have mentioned here, let's change the color to make it really obvious. In fact, I worked out recently, I have a highlighter on here. <laughs> Ooh. There you go, there's the good stuff. Um, Essentially, co-transport is a means of moving things against their concentration gradient um, by moving one other thing first. Okay. Um, year two stuff is the kidneys, yeah. Yeah, so some, some specs mention it in year 13, which is a bit weird because they don't in year 12, but AQA definitely mentioned that throughout. Uh, okay. Many humans are unable to di digest lactose. I found out something quite interesting about this fairly recently, but apparently it's actually most humans can't handle um, lactose. Right, so we're used, oh no, my pen's gone fully highlighter mode, that's not ideal. Um, yeah, apparently most humans can't digest um, lactose, which is really weird. It just happens to be that most Europeans can. But if you go to other places in the world, like lots of parts of Africa and Asia, they just can't digest lactose at all, which kind of makes sense because you're only really supposed to drink milk when you're a little child, when you're a little baby. And most animals become lactose intolerant as they get older because they start eating other foods. It's just, we have a taste for it and we like cheese and we like milk and stuff. But anyway, um, many humans are unable to, to digest lactose. A scientist investigated the production of lactose-free milk. He, uh, it's always a he, isn't it? He produced gel beads containing the enzymes lactase and placed the beads in a column, there you go. He poured milk, milk A, into the column and collected the milk, milk B, after it had moved through the column over the beads. This is shown in the diagram below. Uh, milk A contains no glucose. Milk B contains glucose. Explain why milk B contains glucose. Oh, that took a long time, didn't it? Jazz, very good. Lactase hydrolyzes lactose into galactose and glucose, causing more glucose to be present. Nice. Yeah, I'll give you that. So lactase which is in the gel beads, hydrolyzes, which basically means break down. Get out of the habit of saying break down if you're still that person at A-level. Uh, lactase hydrolyzes um, lactose into galactose and glucose. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all you really need to say for this question. Uh, let's go harder. Let's find something even more complicated. So the enzyme was trapped within gel beads. Suggest one advantage of trapping the enzyme within gel beads. They could use Benedict's test to see if this works, yeah. Why do you have to say hydrolyze when you can say digest? Hydrolyze is more specific than digest. It informs you that it's going to be breaking down water to do it. Um, it's just the advantage of it. It would prevent um, allergies, but that's not what it's really asking. So it's reusable, definitely. Definitely, that's one option. Why else? Good, Lydia, you've said it. So it doesn't get into milk. So the point of having your enzymes in these gel beads is if you didn't, then your milk that you try to then sell to someone is going to have a load of enzyme in, and you'd have to then purify them. That's really expensive. Um, so by putting them into the uh, gel beads, you're stopping the two from mixing, and it also means you can reuse them. So gel beads can be reused, right? And it's also not contaminating the milk or something. I feel like people would be quite upset if their milk ended up having weird stuff in it. Um, not containing 
enzyme in milk. Hang on, bear with me. I just need to plug my laptop in before it decides to die. Okay. Okay, um, so the scientists varied the flow rate of the milk through the column. Um, this isn't related to the ELISA test, no. Uh, the effect of flow rate on the concentration of glucose in milk B is shown in the table below. Uh, explain the difference in the results in the table. So at 50 centimeters cubed per minute, um, I get that amount of glucose. At 100, I get six units of glucose. Why is that? The ELISA test is something which is specifically an AQA, so if you haven't heard of it, don't worry. Right, so if it's too fast, why being too fast? Why? Why, why is uh, it moving through really fast the problem? What's not happening? Why is there more time for lactose to break down? What is happening to lactose for it to break down? Less contact time between the substrate and the enzyme. What's that called? Good, less time for enzyme substrate complexes. Love it, love that word. That is one of those standard words. If it's about enzymes, that's probably the answer, right? So explain the difference in results. Um, 100 is too quick for uh, enzyme substrate complexes to form. Lovely. Ooh, a maths question. This is like the easiest maths question ever, honestly, it's great. Um, the gel beads were all a similar size. Use the formula below to calculate the volume of one of the beads with a 3.0 millimeter diameter. Literally just do what it tells you to do. Someone tell me what the answer is. <laughs> honestly, this maths is all right. You've only got one variable that you need to put in, don't you? So your equation is not one over three. 4 over 3 times pi times a radius. The only way you could get this question wrong is if you didn't know what, what diameter and radius mean. So times 1.5 cubed. When you do that, you should get 14.14. Nice. 9.42. Don't know where that's come from. Just put this in your um, calculator. If... Uh, I don't know, maybe if you're using your phone, you might need to put that in brackets, but it should be fine to just do it like that. Yeah, yeah, I've just rounded it. Uh, where is the official mark scheme? Where is the official mark scheme? Right in front of me, right there. I can see it right there. Do you need to do it to three significant figures? It doesn't tell me to do it to three significant figures, no. Um, you tend to just, you actually tend to stick with what they've given you. So if they've given me um, 3.0, it looks like they're doing it to two significant figures. So if I wanted to, I could do 14.1. Uh, and that's probably the ideal answer here. I was pointing at you, yeah. There you go. Uh, okay, I think I've got like a couple more questions. Maybe two more questions, I believe. Yeah, go on. We'll do a couple more. So the solubility of a substance affects how they are transported. The diagram shows a structure of a molecule of glucose. Can anyone tell me why glucose is um, soluble? Yeah, you're right. Sorry. When I said 14.1 is two significant figures, I did make a mistake. That was me being stupid. Um, yeah, go on, man. Let's say 14 for two significant figures. If I'm copying what they're doing. Thank you. <laughs> right. So why is this molecule soluble? How do we know it's polar from looking at this? How do you know it's charged? <laughs> How do we know it's charged? Yeah, so because it's got oxygen and hydrogens in it, um, we can we can kind of make the assumption that it's going to be slightly charged, it's going to be polar. So because of these groups, I know that there's going to be a slight charge difference. So I know it is polar meaning that hydrogen bonds can form. They're going to form with water, making it soluble. Nice. 
Okay. How do you know that? Because I know that well, you're expected to know that something like water, um, which looks like this, has these slight charges in. So the oxygen is very slightly negative or electronegative, and the hydrogen is very slightly positive or electropositive. And this is very similar. If it's got an H and an O, it means that you're going to get this same pattern where the electrons are actually found a little bit closer to the oxygen. Um, so that means it's going to be polar chemistry, basically. This does come up from... I think this is an edXL question, but this comes up for all of the specs. But you're expected to know that water is polar because of this. Um, two more questions. So galactose is broken down by an enzyme called GAL1PUT. In some types of galactosemia, uh, this enzyme does not function properly. Explain why a mutation in the gene coding for the enzyme GAL1PUT could lead to the inability to break down galactose. So why is it that if there's a mutation, something can't break something down anymore? <laughs> this was in your mock. Oh, I'm very up to date with my questions. If it's in your mock, I'll probably find it. Good. Could affect the amino acids. What about the amino acids? Weeb, you've said it. Um, so cha a mutation changes DNA sequence. Changing of a DNA sequence changes primary structure. Why does a change in primary structure have such a significant effect? This is something that lots of people get confused about. Why does a change in primary structure affect the shape? Good. Um, this changes the position of various bonds. So different R groups, different bonds and this ultimately means we have a different 3D structure. Sounds like my laptop's about to take off. I don't know what it's doing. That can't fit. Okay. Cool. Something along those lines would be really, really good. Um, we could therefore say, because we always say it, um, there are no enzyme substrate complexes. Something like that. That'd be good. Oh my God, no. Aisha, you almost got me to say the word I'm not allowed to say there, but blooming better not. Right, final question. Um, the genetic disorder galactosemia means galactose in the blood. I thought someone would actually ask me what that means, but there you go. Um, galactose in the monosaccharide uh, found in lactose. The structure of lactose is shown in the diagram below. In the space below, draw the products of the hydrolysis of lactose. You can't really draw this. What do I need to add uh, there? And what do I need to add there? <laughs> this one's for me. No. Oh. Mm, some of you have called me out as well. Good. So essentially, um, I would choose for this oxygen to go on one side. So it doesn't matter what side I put it on. Let's just do it properly, eh? Uh, oh, no, I can't bother to do it properly, eh? I'm feeling very lazy. So essentially, what you need to do is, let's say that this oxygen is going to go and join that side. It doesn't actually matter what side to join it. Um, I'm going to put an H next to it. So it's going to be OH. And then on this side, I'm going to put an OH over here. And so long as both sides have an OH, sorry, have an OH and an OH, then you're fine, right? So it's important that you put H2O onto this entire disaccharide, okay? So put an H up here with this O and put an OH down here, then that is your molecule. It does not make um, water, but that is what you need to get this right. So you need to have one side which just has an H added and one side that just has an OH. Okay, right. Ooh, those of you that were waiting to get a nice little benefit. Do you need arrows? No, so hang on, I've done this wrong. I, I did just say that. You'd have to draw it all out exactly as I've just um, said I couldn't be bothered to do. I guess I probably should be a bit bothered, shouldn't I? And if I just ignore all the rest of it, you need to have an H here, here down here, OH there. And on this one, it looks something like that, doesn't it? 
I'm purposefully being lazy. If, you, if this was an actual question, you'd have to draw the whole thing, but I'm being lazy. Um, and then I'm going to put an H up there and an OH down there, right? That would be your full marks. Guys, I need to talk to you about Snap Revise now. So for those of you that have like enjoyed this, excellent. Um, just so you're aware, I am doing so many of these sessions. So every day for the next, I don't know, until everyone goes back to school, I guess, which feasibly could be, I don't know, like four or five months. Um, I'm doing my free YouTube sessions. However, um, because this is my company that I work for, I also do an additional two sessions um, per day that only Snap Revise people can get. So I'm going through all of year 12, not just exam questions, but literally a full lesson that I've made. Uh, I'm doing drop-in sessions where I just sit around and answer questions. I'm doing drop-in sessions where I just answer exam questions that you want me to, and lots of other things. Um, this is what we're offering you. So for those of you that are interested, uh, check out Snap Revise and have a look at what we're offering, because if I'm honest, it is genuinely really, really good, especially when you guys don't have teachers at the moment. So for those of you that are interested, uh, check out our website. And for those of you that aren't yet, uh, don't think that it's quite good enough yet, then I want you to have a look at this. So for those of you that aren't quite convinced, ooh, thank you, go away. Um, for those of you that aren't quite convinced yet, if you go on YouTube, basically there's a list of all the different things that we're doing, different live streams. So this is the one that you're watching right now, as you probably know. There's gonna be a chemistry one um, tomorrow. There'll be a biology one the day after that. And essentially I've made about 10 lessons so far for just different topics. I'm gonna to go through everything, one thing at a time. And by the end of, well, I don't know, hopefully by the time everyone's back at school, um, I will have covered pretty much everything. Okay, so have a look at this, set reminders if you want to, totally free, obviously, but if you like us, then come check out our website, because there's lots of things you can get, and it's, it's genuinely really good, and you get like a month for free anyway. Uh, we don't get a month for free, but you get like a free subscription for a bit, I believe. Um, here is my £10 off code, for those of you who want a month off um, £10, don't know that. This ends tonight, so if you want to like have a look on our website and you are interested, you can get £10 off your first month by entering that code. If you're wondering why it's car B, it's actually carb because of carbohydrates. There you go. Uh, anyway, what are you saying? Would the paid seminars be on YouTube? Um, no, the paid seminar will not be on YouTube. <laughs> oh yeah, and some of you, um, next week I'm gonna be giving one free ultimate subscription away which is like the best service we have so i'll have a thing next week so you can get that but we're not giving too many of them away are there weekend se sessions uh no there are not weekend sessions because i basically don't want to be doing weekend sessions what else are you saying can you say a change in base sequence or do you have to say a change in dna yeah base sequence is fine um primary structure is fine What else are we saying? This is helpful. Good. I'm glad this is helpful. Why one free? What do you mean one free? One free. Why one free? Oh, why YouTube sessions for free? Why not YouTube sessions for free? <laughs> you guys need something to do, right? I need something to do. Why not? Why have we not put it on? Um, why have we not put it on YouTube for free? I guess, I don't know. We've got other things that are free. <laughs> cool excellent what do I do at Snapprovise? I make lessons, I teach lessons I'm the head of biology at Snapprovise. right anyway I reckon that's going to be a good time to finish so guys uh, have a really lovely afternoon and evening I will see you again on possibly on Friday I think we've got one on Friday I assume so, if not I'll be on Monday but it's all on YouTube, check out, check out the stream and let's, let's let, let me just do it. I feel like I need to know what I'm doing anyway. On the third, so whenever the third is, um, I don't know, sorry, I'm 26th because it's the American system, 27th. So yeah, I'm doing a session on Friday because it's Wednesday today. I'm losing track of time. I think quarantine's making go a bit crazy. So tomorrow, chemistry, day after that, biology again. Awesome. Right, see you later, guys. Have a lovely afternoon and I will catch you on Friday.